thank you for coming to the penultimate uh, live event in the Education 2020 series. I'm Checker Finn with the Fordham Institute and the Hoover Institution, a uh, jointly sponsored project that is giving rise to uh, what I just looked through them all the other yesterday, 18 uh, terrific papers, 17 of which are in hand. We haven't seen Bill Bennett's yet. Uh, that are going to emerge as a volume early next year uh, from the Templeton Press and in many other forms and places. Uh, this is our second to the last event. The last one will be June 1 uh, here with Bill Bennett. Uh, and um, we are already beginning with the uh, excellent papers we have in hand to uh, uh, massage them into what I think is going to be a really uh, uh, significant book about the future of education reform, particularly as seen uh, from the conservative side of uh, American, the American thinking class. Uh, and I, I think that's a robust side, but it doesn't always think about education reform. Uh, and so we're thrilled to uh, be doing this. Uh, grateful to the Kern Family Foundation for supporting it, the Hoover Institution for co-sponsoring it. Uh, and uh, today we've got a, uh, a terrific uh, double header uh, I will lead off with uh, Rod Page, and then we will have a very short break, and then Mike Petrilli will follow with Pete Weiner. Uh, Rod Page, as you can read, but as um, you almost certainly already knew, um, is um, one of the most uh, distinguished uh, living American educators. Not only a great superintendent of schools in a pioneering district, but uh, um, Secretary of Education under uh, Bush 43, um, a friend and mentor to many of us, uh, including several people in the room, uh, and um, a member of the Fordham Board, uh, in which role he's been a huge, a huge contributor to, to the work that we do. Uh, his paper on essentially the missing element in education reform, uh, I think is, 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 is outstanding. And after he gives you a quick tour of it, uh, I'll come back up here and we will have a conversation. Without further ado, Rod Page. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we live in a great nation. A significant portion of our nation's greatness is underpinned by our forefathers and foremothers' commitment to a great education system. In today's world, our nation has awakened, other nations have awakened to the power of education to assist with national development. And they've advanced in a race for world leadership. I know you're fully aware that on the world stage, your student performance from an international assessment trails that of many of our neighbors. He says, no need for me to address that issue any further. You're fully aware of that. A better use of my time is to move on to my view of why that is so. Let's begin with this idea. Charles M. Payne a distinguished professor at the School of Social Service Administration at the University of Chicago, chose a fascinating phrase as a title of his compelling 2008 book. As his title, he selected the phrase, so much reform, so little change. The persistence of failure in urban schools. This thoughtful title poses an interesting question all of us should ponder. All of us should wonder, why so little change after so much reform? Why? Paul's central point seemed to be, after all the hard work we've performed in the last four decades to reform American schools, we've actually accomplished very little. Over the 36 years since the publication of an alarmist publication called A Nation at Risk, Americans have invested massive energy and massive capital in attempts to reform America's schools. In this effort, we've tried teacher testing, massive restructuring, student testing, increased funding, alternative schools, extra tutoring, Longer school days, more school days, reduced education bureaucracy, improved American School Act of 1994, no child left behind, raised to the top, and on and on and on and on. Yet, today, we still have 
persistent failure, not only in urban schools, but in suburban and rural schools as well. The question once more, why? Why after so much reform, so little change? The question is as complex as it is puzzling. And notwithstanding the fact that numerous answers have been put forth clearly, as our results indicates, we've yet to come up with an appropriate answer to the why question. So allow me to share my thoughts to the response to the why question. I have at least a partial answer. I admit it's not a full answer, but it's an idea. And my view is primarily drawn from my many years of work in public school, but also reinforced by the thoughts of thinkers like Patrick Wells, who in a captivating way puts insufficient student effort on the table as the primary answer to the question. Patrick Wells. Boldly, he asserts that politicians and educational bureaucrats can talk all they want about reform. But until the work ethic of America's students changes, until they're willing to put in the time and hard work and effort to master that subject, little will change. Now my experience and the thoughts of thinkers like Welch and others has led me to conclude there are principally three, only three distinct but sometimes overlapping approaches to improving student performance in schools. They are, first, improve the quality of instruction. In other words, make teaching better. Number two, improve the quantity of instruction. That's what uh, Kip uses in do it. They put it this way, great teaching and more of it. The third one is improve the quantity and quality of the energy the learner puts into the learning process. The increased student effort approach. In the main, the past school reform efforts have focused primarily on the first two and almost totally disregard the third. For example, over the years, there have been gargantuan efforts to improve student performance using the increased, make instruction better. Teacher testing, merit pay, tighter certification requirements, highly qualified teacher requirements, strong curriculum, improved teacher education, on, on, and on, and on. Regarding the second, increase the quantity of instructional situation in our approach, longer school days, more school days, more time on tasks, more better homework, etc. But even as these approaches represent necessary conditions for effective student learning, unfortunately they also represent insufficient conditions for improving student performance. Third teaching and learning approach Increase the quality and quantity of the psychological and the physical energies learners put into the learning process have received relatively little attention in practice. This, I think, is the real problem. And this is where we find the answer to the why question. I'm not the only one who thinks this way. In his powerful book, How Children Learn, Paul Tuff offers his answer to the why question. He comments. The problem is not only in the schools, but also in the students themselves. Here's why. Learn is hard. True, learn is fun, exhilarating, and gratifying, but it requires work. I also think improving the quality and quantity of instructions are actually the easy approaches to solving this problem. There are more difficult, egregious problems to deal with. They may not seem like the real problem, but they are major problems to some students. There may be far more perplexing issues obstructing learning for many students, aside from the quality and quantity of instruction. Lack of motivation would be the idea. Lack of confidence in themselves is a problem. A belief that the future is controlled by others is a problem are simply to believe that there are easier ways to succeed in life other than go through all the hard work required and be successful in school. And there are more. Of course, there are other reasons. 
But in my view, the most compelling reason why students of why our massive efforts to improve student performance in our schools has reduced such little change is that we have spent, as leaders, insufficient time to motivate students to put forth the required level of psychological and physical injury is required for learning. This situation suggests that the real question we should, we must answer, if we are to substantially increase student performance in schools is why have students exerted such little effort in their learning? Why aren't they trying harder? These are complex and puzzling questions for which there are undoubtedly many answers. But notwithstanding the fact that the problem involves students and their efforts, don't forget, this is also an adult problem. It's an adult problem because it's an adult responsibility to help students to understand the importance of education. It's an adult responsibility to help students understand the relationship between effort and achievement. Students who have been taught these lessons usually succeed in school. The problem is too many students, and maybe as many as two-thirds of those enrolled in school have not been taught these lessons and have not had the opportunity to learn this elsewhere. Such students are products of homes and communities where education is not highly valued and where there's little encouragement for the traits and behaviors associated with school success. This leaves schools with the option of either providing these lessons for their students or to allow the massive student disengagement in schools, school learning to continue unabated. So what can we do? Neil Postman offers some promising, solu promising solutions to the lack of student effort problem. In his celebrated book, The End of Education, Postman, the great American author, media theorist, culture critic, remind us that in the main, we have approached improving schooling problem as if it's an engineering problem. Engineering problems, Postman maintained, are essentially technical problems. Technical problems concerning how something operates. Solving engineering problems involves addressing the issues of where, when, and how things operate. Postman's point is that although where, when, and how problems in education, issues in education deserve some attention, they're not the most important problem, however, is that we have paid too little attention to the why question. Specifically, he claims, and this is a quote from his book, for schools to make sense, the young, their parents, and teachers must have a God to serve. Or even better, several gods to serve. If they have none, school is pointless. To make his point clearer, he points to Nietzsche's famous aphorism. He who has a why to serve can bear any how, and I've added, to serve. Now by God, G-O-D, small letter, to serve, Postman doesn't mean capital G-O-D, God to serve. He means some purpose, some mission, some story, some narrative, as he puts it, some story which directs one's mind to an envisioned future, one that constructs ideals, prescribes rules of conduct, provides a source of authority, and above all, gives a sense of continuity and purpose. Put simply, we tried to improve our schooling by dealing with issues of how, when, and where, but has given too little, and in many cases none, no attention to the why issue. The why of school is important because students who are not achieved in school, in many cases, have no sense of purpose, no positively envisioned future, no last meaning, and in postman term, no God to serve. They see no reason to exert effort in learning tasks which to them are meaningless. As Postman puts it, without a narrative, life has no meaning. 
Without meaning, learning has no purpose. Without purpose, schools are houses of detention, not attention. Postman, in his book, The End of Education. While it is true that good teachers strive to make learning interesting and relevant, so that students are motivated to actively engage, to be actively engaged, there's another view to be considered. Th that view is that students themselves are the final judges of the quality and quantity of physical effort they exert. Students themselves determine how much effort they're willing to put in the learning experience. Learning requires work, and students with no meaning in their lives, no mission to serve, no envisioned future, no great purpose, no struggle, in Postman view, no God to serve, is not likely to see any reason to exert effort in school learning. They're attending schools because they have to. And as soon as they get in charge of the go to school decision, Many of them would drop out, and they do drop out. If not physically, they drop out emotionally. The unfinished aspect of improving America's performance, students' school performance, deal with finding ways to help students develop a why for schooling. We must help them understand that an effective education is not an end goal. Effective education is a means goal, a means to the end goal, which is a better life. Effective education is a means to a better life. Allow me to close by clearly asserting my principal point. In my view, the most destructive factor underpinning America's underperformance is not biological or innate. It is not financial insufficiencies, and also it is not pedagogical shortcoming. These matters are important and deserve our attention and must be managed and handled. But as impediments to student academic achievement, they rank far behind the most harmful barrier in, in uh, retarding school student performance, which is insufficient student effort. An insufficient student effort is a product of low student academic motivation. Substantial student academic performance improvement will not be achieved until we find a way to motivate students to try harder. Thank you. Um, first of all, I've been watching Pete Weiner nod, and I think we're going to end up with greater convergence in this afternoon's two conversations than I thought ahead of time. Uh, that, was, uh, that was fantastic, uh, and your uh, passion uh, came through loud and clear uh, on this issue and uh, is, is well warranted. But y and incidentally, we, we had another wonderful paper in this series by uh, Bill Damon, the Stanford education professor, about the importance of purpose in students' lives as mm -hmm. part of both character development and as part of um, motivation, actually. So uh, there's a, a little bit of a a little bit of a chorus beginning to form within this, uh, within this set of papers. Um, you're certainly clear that our reform efforts haven't paid enough attention to student effort. I concede, I agree. Um, but I think we've got to ask, ask ourselves and ask you, why do you think that is? Uh, is it because uh, we pr it's so much easier to tackle an engineering problem than a motivational problem? Is it because we've We've talked about school reform rather than education reform. Uh, is it because we, it's hard to think of a federal program to, to, do, to do student effort? Um, it's easy to fiddle with the inputs and the, the processes and stuff. But what's, what's your thinking about why this neglect for all these 30 plus years? Well, I haven't really come up with a final answer, but there are a lot of different areas to look at. For example, education culture in America loads learning responsibility on the teacher. The students didn't learn. The teacher didn't teach well. That's an idea we need to examine and see how there's some issues that we can deal with. Fear of blaming the victim 
is a force here that sometimes retards efforts to put in strenuous activities required for, for good learning. Also, there's an idea somewhere that we need to examine that ability outshines effort. Mm -hmm. If you got ability, then you got to put up much effort. If you don't do well, it's not because you didn't put up effort, it's because you didn't have ability. That's, that's an issue that we got to deal with. But the most perplexing issue, I think, is that education policy has become political, politicalized. I experienced that as a superintendent and watch the issues now. It is very difficult sometimes to come up with effective education policy that deals with issues like this because there are powerful thoughts that object to what you're trying to accomplish and, and, and sometimes the political, political side of it wins. So this isn't a, this isn't a, a, a one else issue. It, it's a very complex issue that, that, that many of our international neighbors are not confronted with. And so it, it makes that job considerably different from, from what we've got to do. But I'm not sure that this, is, this, this, this education performance is a, is a national priority. I see literature saying it's a national priority. I hear speeches talking about it's a national priority. But that conflicts with my view when I look at attendance that are voting for our school board elections in the teens, electing people who are going to guide the school board, the school district, going to hire the superintendent, going to approve the curriculum, going to hire the teachers, going to sign the leadership of the schools. And then the uh, board and road turns out in the teens. So the, I, I don't know where to pick out any, any of these issues to find out which one is the most destructive. Mm -hmm. But all of these are uh, issues that great thinkers across America need to look at and figure, figure it out for us. <laughs> well. We're counting on you to be one of them. <laughs> uh, the, uh, why are we such slow learners about this problem? The, I mean, the pain book that you quote and cite is 11 years old. Um, the, uh, it's not as if this point didn't get made, that the efforts weren't working. Uh, and yet we've passed six or eight more federal laws and umpteen state reforms since then. Um, and why are we, are we slow learners as American policymakers? What? Well, I'm not sure I want to think that we're slow learners. I, I think probably we're slow executors. We, we, we're slow in coming up with decisions and committing ourselves to these decisions to get, to get things done. Uh, primarily because uh, in the education policy in the United States of America, it's very political. And, and sometimes the, 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 the gardens of the status quo uh, outguns <laughs> the good guys in the issue, because they, they got the contacts, they got the money, you know, they got the skilled, political skilled people. So uh, our education system is embedded in our political system. That's how we make decisions. And unless we are good at making those kind of, good at, at dealing with this political system, mm -hmm. uh, you're going to lose to the person who has the best uh, control of the political system. So. And I'm not sure that we as educators feel that that's, that's something we need to deal with, but in, in, in somebody needs to deal with it. I don't know who, who, that, who that is. Uh, we, we can count on others to deal with it, but a lot of times that, that, that defeats our good effort, good intent. Yeah. I was, until recently, on the State Board of Education in Maryland. So you got and, that first hand. You know it's... Yeah, <laughs> but I also have to say that the political system there, at least with respect to education policy, is largely controlled by educators uh, who uh, uh, don't particularly want legislators to do anything different than what makes the educators comfortable. Well, well what, what, if I interrupt you and say that we sometimes differ on our definition of educators. All right. All right. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> You alluded to something in your talk that didn't quite come out and say it, and it's a very sensitive topic. I'm wondering if our concern with equity is part of the reason that we're not laying more responsibility on the kids, for fear that if we laid more responsibility or explanation uh, for, let's say, achievement gaps on the kids' effort, we might end up with even worse gaps uh, than we find ourselves dealing with when we blame the schools or the teachers for it. 
Uh, are we, is, is, is that possibly a factor here? It is definitely possibly a factor. I'm not sure I have a good idea on how to address it to bring it about. But there, there, <clears throat> there are islands of excellence uh, with, uh, across the United States, all across the United States where uh, outstanding education is taking place. Uh, I think the problem that we have here is that we don't seem to learn from our good examples. And, and that's because that's not, a, that's not really our goal in some, in some cases. Uh, 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 there are many, I've, I've visited some just unbelievably excellent schools uh, where kids are just sprinting. In all sorts in, of communities. In all, in all, all sorts of communities. Yeah. And, and by the way, I don't, I don't necessarily mean uh, in uh, high economic uh, uh, livelihood communities. I mean, right. I, I'm talking about there are many examples of students with low-income kids who are doing really well. And yes, so indeed. The idea of, of the, the examples that we can use to teach from and to learn from are plentiful, but we, I don't think, take full examples of, examples of that. So you did specifically mention something that... Um, I've been thinking about ever since the late Harold Stevenson started writing about it 30, 40 years ago, uh, which is a kind of cultural difference between the United States and some of our competitor nations having to do with, uh, call it, ability versus effort as, okay. an, expla as an explanatory factor. Uh, his point way back, uh, I think this may well have been before a nation of risk, in any case it was a long time ago, was that Asian countries tend to s assume that effort is what produces your outcome. And Americans, many, uh, tend to believe that w what you were born with determines where you end up, whether it was ability or parentage or, or race or economic status or something else. Uh, and, it's, and, and that a lot of our r rival country, competitor countries actually do think effort makes a difference. Uh, I don't know how to, I mean, first of all, is that, uh, you, you basically said that's part of your diagnosis too. Uh, but say more, and it's a particularly difficult problem to solve if it is indeed a problem. Well, it is definitely a problem. You've just reminded me of the experience I had in the 90s when I was superintendent of schools in Houston. Two parents from another ethnic community came to my office to meet with me without an appointment. Shame on them. Yeah. <laughs> so I was a little reluctant to me with them, but they were persistent. They, they said they would wait. <laughs> so I allowed them to wait for a little while. <laughs> I won't tell you how long. But finally, I did meet with them. The, these two gentlemen wanted to talk about renting some space in one of the schools that was in their community. They wanted to use that space in the afternoon to help students learn. In other words, it was almost another school going on there. I agreed that they could use the space. Mm -hmm. And one afternoon, I decided to drop by to notice it. What I found was uh, volunteers from their community, engineers, physicians, architects, strong people who accomplish teaching algebra, math, English to students. Now the next day, these same students are sitting in the class with other students who didn't have this advantage. How do you think that's going to come out? That's pretty clear. So, so I yeah. think that message teach, talks well, for itself. You're Describing the widespread phenomenon in Asian countries, the juku they call them in Japan, I've forgotten the term in Korea, where kids go sometimes excessively mm -hmm. to after school school yes, and yes. Uh, come home at midnight and then start doing their homework and fall asleep in class the next morning. Yes. So it can be carried to, a, carried to an extreme. But yes, you are describing a, a familiar uh, state of affairs in other countries. You're also describing a familiar state of affairs with some Let's get on to my next question, which has to do with the, uh, 
24% of high school graduates last year who had passed at least one AP test by the time they graduated from high school. <clears throat> Basically a quarter of the graduating class had passed at least one AP test. Okay. Um, they, uh, something has motivated them to, to take a hard course and to study hard enough to uh, do well on a tough, tough exam. Whether it's an internal motivation or a parental motivation or something else like that. Um, uh, first of all, um, let me note that a fair number of them have had extra tutoring and the kind of thing that you've been describing uh, and extra help from parents and extra help from here and there. Um, but there's some degree of motivation there coming from someplace. And then there's the other three quarters of the graduating class who didn't pass an AP test. Um, first of all, is this a good metric uh, for sort of gauging effort at cum achievement? Uh, and if so, uh, a quarter is a big number. Um, it's, not, it's not nobody. It's a lot of kids. How do we get to the other three quarters is the beginning of the next part of the conversation. Well, I would be uh, def def definitely appreciative of the 24%. But I would be disappointed that it's only 24%. Uh -huh. I, I, that's, that, that's not what I think we, we need as a nation. I congratulate the 24% and those who helped bring it about. But I agonize over the fact that you've just left out 75% yeah. of those who, are not, getting, who, who are, not, are not getting it done. I think we need more of a national idea and effort towards a national movement up the education ladder. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the first things I read when I, was, when I came to, to Washington was a, a report by Rugman and Hart. Mm, the word gap, the vocabulary the word, gap. No, no, not the vocabulary no. gap. The, it was the, 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 the report that, it was a report about national security. The national security for the 21st century uh, is the name of the report. Okay. I think around 2002, yep. maybe 2001. Yep. And all national reports about how our nation uh, is doing uh, talk about economic issues and other kinds of issues. But this report identified education as one of the critical issues that we have to do in order to, to protect national security. In other words, uh, it is a national security issue. And, and, and where we gr congratulate the, those 24% of students who uh, have access to outstanding uh, curriculum, uh, that's not enough. We need to go deeper. Yeah, there was another somewhat similar report done by, as I recall, Joel Klein and Condi Rice that came to uh, yes. also picked up on the national mm -hmm. security importance here. And yet, you know as well as I do that every year's Gallup poll shows most parents content with their own child's school. They might yeah. think that there's a national crisis. They might think that there's a crisis on the other side of town. They might think that there's a crisis for somebody else's kids in somebody else's school, but they don't seem to bring it home. To their own, to their own, even the parents I'm talking about now, not the educators, their complacency. Well, it's it's difficult. I'm not sure I'd use the term complacency, but if I could find another term that would not quite be as hard as that, but the concept is, I think, I think, I think it's right, and I think it's, it's I think it's not just parents; it's a national issue mm -hmm. because we can't. We, we, we can't be left with the view that schooling and excellent schooling, excellent education is an issue just for parents and children who are, have access to the education. It's a much broader issue. It's, 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 it's not just for them, it's for our society. So even if, if, if you have no children in school, you have a real need to have an uh, uh, effective education system. So let's get to the tough question of, so what, what do we do? Uh, this is, uh, I mean, if kids, if most kids are insufficiently self-motivated to uh, achieve uh, as well as they could, uh, it seems to me there are two broad directions that, that could change that. One is to do something that will build internal motivation. Uh, whether it's for greater success in life, greater wealth, greater prosperity, something uh, that uh, purpose in life, uh, God, to, uh, God to worship with a small g, um, 
the other is external, uh, call it negative consequences if you don't work hard. Uh, you don't get promoted to the next grade. You don't get to go to graduate. You don't get to go to college. Um, the, uh, where do you come down on, is it a mix that we need? Is it one or the other? What's your, what's your, how do you size the, up that choice? I think we have to have both. Now, I know there are many who are, are reluctant to accept uh, consequences that are sometimes deemed as strenuous, but I would remind them that behavior is a, a function of the consequences they are. In other words, uh, we do need uh, some issue that would say this isn't the right behavior. And, and, and behavior sometimes points us towards repeating the, the kind and successful part, mm -hmm. but we don't repeat the, the kind that is a little bit negative. So it, we, we need both sides of that. We, we definitely need both sides. So on the external consequence side, um, the ones that come to my mind are things like uh, end of course exams that the state administers, graduation exams that you have to, to get to pass to get a diploma. Uh, and yet the country's been drifting, drifting away from those. States have been cutting back on end of course exams. States have been cutting back on graduation, uh, mandatory graduation tests. Uh, and I'll add that uh, conservatives have been pushing as hard for reducing this testing burden, as they would call it, as, 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 as liberals have been doing. Um, as, what's to be done on the external motivation side? I would ask this question. If we look at the NAEP results, no, let's, let's look at the OECD results. That gets worse. Yeah. <laughs> Let's look at the nations that are leading. Do we find any of them going backwards with the accountability issue? You see this idea of accountability being attacked and rolled back uh, in many areas in the United States. But can you point to a, a nation that is achieving uh, and, and, and get that same type of, uh, of answer? Of course not. Um, the, though they tend, most countries, this is a huge generalization, anything it like is, this is, is. Yeah, the countries tend not to have these sort of negative consequences, like you don't get promoted. They rather have a kind of scarcity, scarcity motivation. You, you can't get into university unless you um, get to a certain score on the national exam or something like that. Um, they ration the success, the success opportunities and motivate people that way. We tend to say open enrollment, college, yes. Uh, high school diploma, yes, everybody. Uh, we, don't, we don't make things scarce. We make things universally available. Well, I won't take a position on which strategy would work best. I would only insist that there has to be some consequences that says this is not the best idea to have no accountability. I couldn't agree more, um, but I wish uh, your friends in the Texas legislature weren't rolling back the end of course exams the way they've been doing. And by the way, uh, I'm re reasonably active in trying to retire that as well. I, I know, but uh, this is a, I mean, part of it's the national anti-testing anti thing, uh, but the point I simply want to sort of lay on here is that this isn't just coming from the left. Yes. This is coming from uh, our side, too, uh, as too much, bur too much testing, too much state interference, too much this, too much that. And, and it may be too much. I, I won't argue with what is enough, but it has to be a part of a comprehensive system. So let's get to the question of school culture, which you talk about quite a lot in your paper. I know you didn't say a whole lot about it in, 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 in your talk. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know the familiar Amanda Ripley book where she followed American high school students to uh, three other countries and concluded that uh, in all three countries, uh, if memory serves, it was Finland, Poland, and Korea, I think. Um, they go to high school to learn and get ahead. And in America, they go to high school for sports and fun, social life. Um, and that's, I don't know if that's the school's culture or just the adolescent culture in America or both. Uh, but it seemed to me to be a profound, profoundly important uh, kind of comparative statement 
uh, if our kids aren't going to high school to learn, but are going to, for fun and activities. Uh, is there anything? I mean, how do you tackle that? Well, I, 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 I hear two sided issues in your comment. Okay. First of all, uh, I, I don't necessarily associate these non scholarly activities as non scholarly. For example, had it not been for football, I wouldn't be sitting here. Fair point. <laughs> <laughs> I attended college on a, on, on a football scholarship. Both of my parents helped with a lot of expenses. But uh, a lot of the things that I've learned, I learned from that kind of experience. So I, I, I think that a lot of the non-academic but extracurricular activities mm -hmm. are very important to cultural development and for academic development for, for students. I've just read a couple of studies on how students who were in rigorous band activities uh, achieved higher than students who were not involved. So mm. I, I think that it's not the activity it's the issues that are associated with the goals of the activities. Great. Uh, thank you both for these great comments. Thank you, Secretary Page. So I want to pick up on that. Uh, new book out by Jal Mehta and Sarah Fine about uh, where they go in search of deeper learning in American high schools and mostly don't find it, uh, at least in traditional academic courses uh, with a few exceptions. But where they do find it is in the extracurriculars. It's mm -hmm. in the electives. Mm -hmm. It's in the stuff that is supposed to be sort of on the side. Uh, and they write a lot about how, you know, what, what can we do to try to bring this into the academic core. Uh, but they make the point that in the extracurriculars, like sports, uh, theater, they talk a lot about, uh, you have students putting a whole lot of effort in. I mean, really, they are, you know, this is where there is energy and effort uh, and diligence and deeper learning. Uh, and, uh, and that is in part because uh, these things are real. You know, they're going to put on a play and people are going to actually see it and they want it to be good or they're going to go play a football game and they want to win. And so they put in that effort and how can we make that same intrinsic motivation work within the schools? Now some people in the personalized learning world say, well, the way you do that is you give kids more choices. You know, that, that, you know the problem is we're making kids all take a civics class and they don't care about civics. And so if we, instead we let them study what they want to study, maybe they'd be more intrinsically motivated uh, and we'd see more effort. Do you want to go to civics class or sex ed? Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, so let, I, I guess I, first of all I want to put that question out there. I mean, is, is that, is part of the problem that we're sort of making high school kids learn stuff that they may not be interested in or is that just something we got to do? I mean, part of this is you got to eat your broccoli and, you know, that's just part of the deal. I, I'm kind of at a puzzle on how to put sides to come down on that. Because I see a need for both. Uh, and uh, I, I believe that as a core set of ideas and issues that, that everybody should learn. I'm, I'm concerned that civics is not required strongly in many places. I, I think that has a lot to do with our national well-being. So uh, I, 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 that should be a divide here. Students should have an opportunity to to be deeper in these ideas and courses that they are very interested in. But there also are some requirements to, that should be there that being a United States citizen uh, requires you to, to do, uh, to, to learn. So I would just hope that some scholarly people would take a good look at that and come up with a decision. I, I don't have a specific answer to that, but understand that both are required. And then just one more idea, and then I'll give up the mic, is, you know, you say very well that there's a lot of kids in high school who just don't want to be there. Uh, they're forced to be there. So what if we gave them a way out? And we said, and, and, and actually Checker was on a commission in Maryland that proposed something like this. It says, look, let's say at the end of 10th grade, you pass a series of exams. There's the exams again, but in the core academic subjects, in civics, uh, you know, in what the public wants young people to know, you pass those exams, and then if you do well, you get to move on to do something you might really want to do, like a high quality career and technical education program where you're spending a bunch of time at a workplace, maybe even getting paid to do so, working with adults and learning a skill. Uh, and you get sprung from all the stuff that you don't, you know, but, but you have to demonstrate that you have the academic skills, first of all, that the public wants you to have and that you're going to need to have to succeed in those kinds of high quality programs. I mean, is this, do we, can we start to create some some positive incentives for young people, 
you know, where they say, look, if, if I do the work and I learn this math that I don't really care about, but I need to know, I get some personal benefit out of it. Absolutely. I think, as a matter of fact, I would come down on the side where some good, thoughtful people would come up with a system that would take advantage of that very idea. That may be the solution to a lot of the situations where kids are there. They don't find anything that interests them. They feel forced to do things that they find irrelevant. But there's another side of it, too. And that's some of the things that they may not see as important now. It may be because they have not had adequate explanation about it. They have not been experienced with it. So that we have to find a way to, to deal with that side of it as well. Some people, many educators, would say that if the school were more attentive to, dare I say, social-emotional learning and more attentive to pedagogies that involve things like group, group projects and other things which are more, um, more like a football team, actually, a little bit more like uh, collaborative work, things where other people are depending on you, things where you have to work with other people, stuff like that, that this will tend to motivate kids to, want to do better and learn more. In other words, that there are some pedagogical uh, moves that might lead to greater motivation, and there might be some school, call it school climate moves, that might lead to greater motivation. I, I also worry that those can get carried away into, into squishy, squishy stuff that settles for uh, kids being happy and, and never eating their broccoli. Um, but what do you think about the ability of, of, of classroom practices and school culture to that kind of school culture to make a difference well I, I, would, I would i would agree with that completely but here, here's here's i think kind of the global's way to approach all of this is is, is if there were certain specific learnings that a citizen of the united states of america should be able to accomplish being clear and being required was all Americans. And also the choice where students could do other things that interest them personally. So both. Both. Yeah. So that there's a required set of learnings, and then there are, available, there, there are many things that are available to you that you can choose from mm -hmm. to fit whatever your interest is. You're in a second effect. You you, you got to eat your broccoli, but there's a choice of desserts or a choice. Right, of and it's in terms of education policy, our policy should be able to provide that type of freedom for people to develop learning institutions that mm -hmm. provide certain specific learnings that fit into that category. That that should be wider choice, and 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 certain part of the. Education system is required. Certain part of it is, and we do know. I mean, I'm all with you on the on the choice issue. Partly because we know that people get more enthusiastic about something that they've chosen for themselves. Absolutely. Um, and uh, the I don't get nearly as enthusiastic about the rental car that Avis chose for me uh, <laughs> as I as I do about the one I'm going to buy or 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 uh, rent for myself where I get to sit in this one and try it out and sit in that one and see if my friend fits in the back seat and stuff like that. Um, okay, we've got time for a few more uh, people here to uh, inquire or comment. There's one person over on the side there. Say who you are. Hi, I'm Emily. I'm with the Progressive Policy Institute. and. I'm interested in your opinion on what I consider a disconnect between these, um, I want to say district policies that are, that are good, you know, like time on task and be in your seat and everyday counts, uh, you know, that try to show this learning matters motivation. Yet at the same time, a lot of districts and ed schools are forcing policies on teachers um, at worst and encouraging them to do it at best where it's like, don't give a zero. If someone turns in nothing, the lowest grade they can get is a 50. Um, you know, don't grade lateness because, you know, that's, that's a behavior, not a skill. So you're judging them on, on not a mastery of a subject, but on, on a behavior. And to me, it really seems to not only send conflicting messages to students, but also undermine the efforts of teachers who are trying to motivate students to work hard. And so first, what's your opinion on that? But second, where do, what do you think is driving this what to me seems a massive uh, movement across districts to embrace these kind of policies. 
I'm really not sure what's driving it, but I'm as disturbed about that kind of idea as you've just expressed. Uh, and I read about it uh, in the literature and in the news media uh, and, and agonize over it. It's, it sometimes may be coming from people who want to do children good, but I think they're so misguided because it does, but there are certain things that are required and, and should be. So I, I don't know if I could give you a specific answer on that, except that I want you to know and the world to know that I believe that uh, much of this kind of idea of softening the avenue is, is doing a destructive issue for our, us as a nation. Well, if we don't want to give anybody bad news, mm -hmm. if we want to give everybody at least a B plus, mm -hmm. and if we uh, don't want to ding anybody for missing out on some on being absent, let's say, uh, then we're clearly diminishing motivation to succeed uh, rather than rather than building it up. And I certainly sense a fair amount of that going on, uh, as she does, as you do, uh, in American Education Day, which is n another way of saying we're, we may be worsening the problem that you came here to talk about. On that cheery note, who else has something they, uh, yes, sir? Who are you? You're well, from? I'm Boyle Public Affairs. Thank you. Uh, I was fascinated by your talk and agree with it entirely. And we've had a, a similar problem in the UK of trying to rebuild a culture of high expectations after a long period of prizes for all. Motivation is a, is a part and parcel of how you define success. And do you think, um, certainly here in the West, we've narrowed our definition of success? And partly that means relegating, being obsessed about getting kids into university and relegating vocational education to a sort of um, booby prize that you get if you weren't good enough to get into uh, higher education. If you look, for example, at a, a, a high-performing jurisdiction like Germany, they have a very strong, very rigorous vocational pathway. I'm not sure I completely understand your issue, but, but I, I I really do understand the last part of the sentence that you, the last sentence you made, especially this, the situation in Germany about vocational issues. Uh, I, I think that we've kind of made a transition from vocational issues not being respected to vocational issues being respected now. For example, uh, I read an article somewhere, I may not have this exactly right, but it said that uh, uh, there's, as much there's as much technology in an advanced automobile now as there was uh, in, the, in the vehicle that was sent to the moon early, some, t some time ago. So, so we can't really just disregard respect for the vocational skills and the vocational ideas because they're really important, it's not only for national development, but for also ideas. A brief commercial, Fordham came out with a pretty interesting paper on con uh, CTE um, about 10 days ago, and uh, AEI has come out with another very good one today. Uh, and uh, for those interested in both the trajectory that you were talking about and, in, and, and that you were talking about in, in the UK, uh, I think it's well worth looking at the data that these, these two studies have unearthed about who's taking what, how that's changed over time, whether it aligns with real world incentives like jobs uh, and things like that. We have time for one more. If there is another burning question in the crowd. If there is not, let's thank Rod and take a short break, and then we will see the, the Pete and Mike show. Hi, everybody. I'm Mike Petrilli, president of the Thomas B. Fordham Institute and a visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution. Great to be here. And this is exciting. We are rounding the, the bend here. Uh, this is our second to last event in the Education 2020 series. We've got one more. Uh, former Secretary of Education Bill Bennett is going to play uh, uh, Roundup. He's going to wrap it all up at the end uh, in, in June. Uh, but before that, I'm very excited uh, that a longtime friend of his uh, is going to give us a fantastic talk about character education. Now, uh, one of the best parts about this series that we've been doing for me personally is that I have gotten to listen to and even introduce some of my heroes uh, and folks that I have been reading for my whole professional life. Uh, and one of those people is Peter Weiner. Uh, Pete has been writing about uh, the issues that our country is grappling with uh, for decades now. Uh, and he has served in multiple administrations. Uh, most recently, he was in the George W. Bush administration in the White House. 
Uh, in what, what's the uh, let me get the right uh, the Office of Strategic Initiatives. This was the I think uh, often discussed as the Office of Strategery. Yes, okay. If you remember those days. Uh, but he has been writing uh, about the challenges that we face as a country and the solutions. Uh, and most recently, he has gotten to write for some, some pretty big publications. He is now a regular columnist at the New York Times and is also writing for The Atlantic. So this is very exciting. You can find his work there. But he's also, uh, over the years, written and uh, co-authored and co-edited many, many books. Some of the recent ones, uh, one with Michael Gerson called City of Man, Religion and Politics in a New Era, Wealth and Justice, the Morality of Democratic Capitalism, co-authored with Arthur Brooks, uh, who was just here recently. And he's got a new book coming out uh, by Harper, uh, from HarperCollins, The Death of Politics, How to Heal Our Frayed Republic After Trump, which is coming out in June. So uh, a fantastic thinker, writer, uh, busy guy, somebody who, uh, again, has, has seen politics at the very highest levels. And he has written a fantastic uh, essay for us on character education. Uh, not so much the how, but the why. And we look forward to hearing from him today. So please join me in welcoming Pete Weiner. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mike, for that kind introduction. Secretary Page, great to see you. Uh, thanks for your service to the country. Former colleague in the Bush administration, Checker Finn, former colleague in the Reagan administration. Hey years ago uh, to the uh, Fordham Institute and the Hoover Institution for, uh, for hosting uh, this uh, event and this whole series of events. Um, I'd like to begin with a uh, story uh, from a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. The year was 1987, which is when I began working uh, as a speechwriter uh, for then Secretary of Education uh, William Bennett. Checker will recall that uh, Bill's agenda consisted of the three C's, content, uh, choice, and character. And in some respects, it was the last of these character which was the most contentious. Bill argued with conviction and passion that it was the role of schools not only to shape the intellect, but also the character uh, of the young uh, to, in his words, help them develop reliable standards of right and wrong to help guide them through life. That uh, view was uncontroversial for most of American history. From the beginning, character education was a fundamental part of the mission of American education. To, to disregard the former was to uh, deracinate de the latter. And so it was widely thought uh, until right around uh, a half century ago. And for the purposes of this uh, talk, let me touch briefly on the history of character education uh, in, in America. The New England primer, known as the Little Bible of New England, was the first primer used throughout colonial America. Less than 100 pages long, it advanced a Puritan ethic, relying on rhymes like, in Adam's fall, we sinned all, uh, as well as pictured alphabets, uh, catechisms, and religious maxims. Eventually, millions uh, were printed, and they shaped uh, the moral landscape of America. John Phillips, the founder of the Phillips Exeter Academy, expressed what was a commonly held view when in 1781 he defined its mission. Above all, he stated, it is expected that the attention of instructors to the di disposition of the minds and morals of the youth under their charge will exceed every other care. Well, considering that though goodness without knowledge is weak and feeble, yet knowledge without goodness is dangerous and that both united form the noblest character and lay the surest foundation of usefulness to mankind. In the 18th uh, century, according to Michael Josephson, uh, a leading champion of character education, parents valued character and they expected public schools to help their children become both smart and good. Educators embraced this responsibility gladly, according to Josephson. There was no effort to separate the teaching of knowledge from the teaching of virtue. In the 19th century, the common school, the forerunner of the public schools that was designed by the education reformer Horace Mann, saw the moral instruction of students as one of its central purposes. And there were differences over how exactly that should be done. For example, whether to include the Bible as part of the curriculum whether or not specific denominational indoctrination should occur 
and whether there was too much focus on Protestant-centered morality. But it was nevertheless assumed that an emphasis on inculcating moral habits was a strong component of education. Indeed, the common schools came into being in part as a response to threats of social fragmentation and moral and social decay. In his landmark 1818 report on the, uh, of the commissioners for the University of Virginia, Thomas Jefferson described the purposes of education, which included improving one's morals and faculties. It spoke about instructing the masses of our citizens in these, their rights, interests, and duties as men and citizens, and cultivating their morals and instilling into them the precepts of virtue and order. And it articulated the aim of education to form them to habits of reflection and correct action, rendering them examples of virtue to others and of happiness within themselves. For much of the 20th century, the importance of character education was still more or less a given, despite a variety of philosophical movements like logical positivism that challenged the view that our public institutions, including schools, should instill ethical standards and moral principles. But the latter half of the last century was something of an inflection point, for it was then that the so-called values clarification and cognitive moral development movements began to take hold. At the heart of the values clarification was the belief that morality was subjective rather than objective, that neutrality on moral questions was the proper stance, and that the goal of education was not to instill traditional virtues, but to help students clarify their own values and create their own value system. The focus was on moral autonomy at the expense of moral authority. On questions of ethics, teachers became facilitators more than they became instructors. That view isn't as fashionable now as it was then. And it's notable that Lawrence Kohlberg, an influential psychologist at Harvard, who criticized traditional moral education on the grounds that it was indoctrination, undemocratic and unconstitutional in his words, uh, Kohlberg revised his views, admitting uh, in 1978, the educator must be a socializer, teaching value, content, and behavior not merely a Socratic facilitator of development. In becoming a socializer and advocate, the teacher moves into indoctrination, a step that I originally believed to be invalid, both philosophically and psychologically. I no longer hold those negative views of indoctrinative moral education, and I now believe that the concepts guiding moral education must be partly indoctrinative. This is true by necessity in a world which children engage in stealing, cheating, and aggression. It uh, does raise the question of what world he was living in before when he held uh, the beliefs that he did, but in any event, uh, better late than never. Uh, nevertheless, the damage was done, and the widespread consensus that schools should engage in moral education was fractured. Since then, there's been something of renewed interest in character education. The result of character education programs are somewhat mixed, with some studies reporting success, while others have found that for the most part they don't produce any improvements in student behavior or academic performance. As one might expect, much of the success uh, of moral formation in schools depends on the quality of the curriculum and training, how effective the implementation is, whether there's assessment and accountability, uh, whether uh, models and mentors play a prominent role, and how much buy-in there is not only from students and school leadership, but from parents in the wider community. And here I want to commend a recent book by the University of Virginia's Institute for the Advanced Study in Culture titled The Content of Their Character, Inquiries into the Varieties of Moral Formation, which explores how American high schools directly and indirectly inculcate moral values in students. In order to do this, researchers visited a national sample of schools in each of 10 sectors urban public, rural public, charter, evangelical Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, Islamic, prestige independent, alternative pedagogy, and home schools. The results, quote, point to a new model for understanding of the moral and formation of children and new ways to prepare young people for responsibility and citizenship in a complex world, unquote. Now, I don't believe the issue of character education is a simple one. 
certainly in our increasingly diverse, multi-ethnic, pluralistic nation. To be sure, some people, including within the education establishment, don't think that schools should pay much attention at all to cultivating the moral life of their students. But that's hardly a majority opinion. The more mo common concerns are these. Whose values do we teach? What might uh, respect for authority, when might respect for authority undermine individualism and justice? And how do we teach them? For example, what role, if any, should religious teachings play in moral education? There's also pressure that teachers feel to focus on academic standards, leaving little time and energy to focus on character education, as well as the understandable fear educators have of being drawn into contentious social and political debates. Teachers also tell me that increasingly parents take the side of their children when schools attempt to hold them accountable for misconduct. Enforcing discipline in the classroom has never been harder. In addition, people are shaped by an array of factors, including family of origin, non-school social settings, genetics, and the biomedical roots of human behavior. How character is shaped is a complex matter then, and too often too much responsibility is placed on schools when it comes to the formation of character. Character education programs, if they're done well, can do some good for some number of students, but even that good can be washed away by neglect, by abuse, by peer groups, and by heredity. In general, parents are greater moral influence, have a greater moral influence on their children than schools, and yet we know that children of responsible and attentive parents can go astray. But neither do I believe that character education is a hopeless undertaking, something beyond our reach and our wit. For the remainder of uh, my remarks, then, I want to focus not on how we should go about the teaching of character education, but really on the prior question, which is why moral education matters, because I'm not sure that we're as clear on that as we should be. A uh, good friend of mine recently told me that even the language of character sounds like a dead language, like one is speaking Latin. Now, one compelling argument for instilling character in the young is that it's essential for academic achievement. It's impossible to teach or to learn in a setting where students are rude and disciplined and in charge. If self-control doesn't exist in a classroom, chaos will prevail, and chaos is the enemy of intellectual excellence. Self-control, the mastery over one's passions, impulses, and desires, is a basic virtue and not a particularly natural one. It needs to be taught. We know that self-discipline is among the most important traits when it comes to, to student success, and that's particularly true for the iPhone generation, when the temptations to distract are greater than ever, and schools that are disorderly and characterized by disruption will fail. According to the neuro, ne, neuroscience researchers Sandra Amat and Sam Wong, who co-authored co Welcome to Your Child's Brain, childhood self-control is twice as important as intelligence in predicting academic achievement. But there's much more to character development than its academic utility. Character is essential to a fulfilled life and ordered liberty, something the ancient Greeks and the American founders both understood. For Aristotle, true happiness is found in living well and attaining excellence in character and exhibiting virtue. Those are the highest goods, he believed, and the only way to achieve inner harmony. This was consistent with the view of Socrates, who believed that those who are not virtuous cannot be happy. When we give it even a moment's thought, most everyone agrees that good character, qualities like courage, compassion, empathy, kindness, honesty, respect for others, trustworthiness, loyalty, fidelity, friendship, fair-mindedness, honor, perseverance, and self-control are integral to a good life. Those who embody these virtues never regret having done so. The ultimate joys are moral joys, David Brooks wrote in his marvelous book, The Road to Character. This understanding of things can't be proven like a mathematical equation, and I suppose people who are fundamentally corrupt and malicious can claim that they possess inner harmony and are at peace with themselves and the world. I just don't believe them. And I rather doubt that they believe themselves. The reason, I would say, is teleological. We are made to live a certain way. We are born with a moral sense, an innate understanding of right and wrong, and to borrow from C.S. Lewis, our souls are made to conform to moral reality. There are ramifications when we do 
and the ramifications when we don't. Here's David Brooks again. Occasionally, even today, you come across certain people who seem to possess an impressive inner cohesion. They're not leading fragmented, scattershot lives. They have achieved inner integration. They are calm, settled, and rooted. They are not blown off course by storms. They don't crumble in adversity. Their minds are consistent and their hearts are dependable. These are the people who have built a strong inner character and who have achieved a certain depth. In these people, at the end of the struggle, the climb to success has surrendered to the struggle to deepen the soul. The reason we should strive for the cultivation of good character isn't for reasons of prudishness or priggishness, because we're censorious and killjoys. It's rather because good character leads to human flourishing, because there is not only honor to be found in living a moral life, but joy too. Yet even that is not the whole story. In a free society like the United States, where external constraints on how we live our lives are limited, internal constraints are all the more necessary. James Madison, the most important figure in the creation of the Constitution, put it this way in Federalist Paper number 55. As there is a degree of depravity in mankind which requires a certain degree of circumspection and distrust, so there are other qualities in human nature which justify a certain portion of esteem and confidence. Republican government presupposes the existence of these qualities in a higher degree than any other form. Later at the Virginia Ratifying Convention of 1788, Madison said this, I go on this great Republican principle that the people will have virtue and intelligence to select men of virtue and wisdom. Is there no virtue among us? If there be not, we are in a wretched situation. No theoretical checks, no form of government can render us secure. To suppose that any form of government will secure liberty or happiness without any virtue in the people is a chimerical idea. If there be sufficient virtue and intelligence in the community, it will be exercised in the selection of these men so that we do not depend on their virtue or put confidence in our leaders, but in the people who are to choose them. Thus, Madison believed, as did the entire founding generation, that Republican government could not thrive without a virtuous citizenry. The American founders believed this was a vital task, but certainly not an easy one. Irving Kristol, one of the more consequential intellectuals of the latter half of the 20th century, wrote that we moderns are much more negligent than the founders were about the complicated ways which the transformation of a community of individual sinners into a good community takes place, and in his words, uncomprehending as to the constant rigorous attentiveness necessary for it to take place at all. Which brings me back uh, to the issue of character education. Our schools are but one institution of many that are tasked with shaping the moral lives of the young. The philosopher Martin Buber, while warning not to overestimate what the educator can do to develop character, wrote, education worthy of its name is essentially education of character. For the genuine educator does not merely consider individual functions of his pupil as one intending to teach him only to know or to be capable of certain definite things, but his concern is always the person as a whole, both in the actuality in which he lives before you now and in his possibilities in what he can become. Society can't create virtuous citizens without the help of schools, but schools can't create virtuous citizens without the help of society, of individual communities, of parents. Student character and ethics will only be a priority for schools if they are a priority in the hearts and minds of adults. And too many adults have forgotten that virtue, the good life, and the good society are links in a golden chain. We can't will the end, citizens of good character, without willing the means to the end, inculcating virtue in the young through moral precepts, through example and habit, through rewards and punishment, through conversations and stories. We've done it reasonably well before. We need to do it again for the sake of the children we care for and love and for the nation we revere. Thanks very much. So, so many uh, words of wisdom there. Uh, so I get to interview you. Okay. And we'll open it up uh, to the audience. And I want to start with where you started, which was the history 
And I think it was important. He reminded us that uh, for much of our history, our public schools uh, were not the secular schools that we're used to today. I mean, that they, they were explicitly teaching religion. It was a, they were teaching Protestantism. Right. Uh, so much so that, you know, at the turn of the, you know, when we were going from the 19th to 20th century, uh, the bishops, the Catholic bishops in America looked around and said, this is a problem. You know, we're, our, our children are going to school and they're being, uh, you know, taught a different religion. And so we need to create an alternative system of Catholic schools. Right. Uh, and also because they felt that the Catholic students were being uh, treated unfairly and discriminated against. So at some point later on in the 20th century, not only did we turn away from teaching character education, or at least teaching morals and values from a place of authority, but we also turned our public schools into secular schools. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think if you ask most Americans, people are not super eager to go back to a time when the public schools were, say, Protestant schools, right? So I guess the question is this. You know, could there have been a way in the mid-20th century or in the 60s or 70s for us to make the schools secular without giving up on this notion of, of teaching morals and teaching character from a place of authority? Uh, yeah, it's, 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 a, uh, it's a good question. Um, and it, it, I mean, there's some deeper issues here, which is what's the role of religion uh, in moral education and can you be secular and can you, um, can you uh, teach moral education in an effective uh, way on the second question, I, I think my answer would be we better figure out how mm -hmm. because 91 percent of students go to public schools, not, not private uh, or religious schools. Mm -hmm. uh, and so um, most of the education uh, is going to, the vast majority of education is going to go on in public schools. And they don't, they're not exclusively religious institutions. And they can't be today like they were mm -hmm. in the past because we had much more of a common culture in the um, 18th and 19th century than 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 we do uh, than we do today, so we we've got to be able to do it as to, as to this relationship between moral education, religion, and and secularism, um, and and how do those work together? Look, I'm open to the argument that that religious schools have an advantage over non-religious schools when it comes to moral education. Um, and, and I think actually in this book that was done by the, uh, the University of Virginia, mm -hmm. you can see some of that because more, uh, religious institutions are able to make an appeal that non-religious institutions aren't. This is what God teaches. You, you, you believe in God and that's the right way to do it. Um, but the reality is that there are a lot of institutions that are not religious that inculcate great moral character. Uh, and I don't think religion is necessary in the same way that I don't think a person has to themselves be religious to be a good good person. Um, I was actually having a fast. I'm, I speak, by the way, as a person who's who's a Christian, grew up in an evangelical tradition, and I was having uh, breakfast with a, a friend of mine who's who's a um, atheist, and he asked me, um, in my experience, uh, between people who are religious and non-religious, do I see much of a difference, or how much of a difference do I see in the in the character of how they've conducted their lives over the course of my life, and my answer was not much, actually. Um, I'd say it's it's a it's uh, it's a wash. Um, and indeed, just as a side note on that, I think one of the dangers that, that can happen is that when when people of religious faith, they can take certain tendencies, predilections, or problematic uh, attitudes, uh, and then they can baptize them. And say that this is actually has the has the imprimatur of God or or religion behind it, so things can go very much um, askew. Um, and while there's a really interesting debate about which goes back centuries or millennia, really, which is uh, you know, uh, okay, what's the moral foundation of life without God? It's a fascinating question. You don't have to get into that in schools. I think it's it's a more simple proposition which is uh, one thing that you need for moral education to, to succeed uh, is you have to have uh, teachers and principals who themselves live admirable moral lives and are going to be examples to students. A second thing that you need are rules, uh, rules that are, make sense, uh, that are against bullying and got to be there on time and you've got to, uh, you can't talk in class and you have to be able to uh, 
uh, to enforce them. Um, so that's required. And then the curriculum is, is necessary. And Checker will remember this. He'll remember a lot of this, actually, from our days at the Department of Education. Um, but there, uh, there are so many great stories in the history of literature and, and, and in political documents uh, that you can that you can teach all sorts of virtues. You uh, and it doesn't have to be from the Bible. You can be. I mean, if you want to talk about friendship, Jonathan and David, or uh, Ruth's loyalty to Naomi, or the Good Samaritan story. I don't think that there's any problem in in those. But there are stories from 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 Shakespeare and the Greeks. I mean, you can go on and on and on. And and Bill Bennett actually turned this into a very successful uh, series of books: <laughs> the Book of Virtue right. and the Moral Compass. So you need the curriculum, you need the rules, you need the adults, the, the teachers, and, and, the, uh, and the principals to uh, both enforce morality and to uh, embody morality. And I think uh, that one will be fine. Last thing I'll say is one of the best things that we did uh, during Bill's tenure at the Department of Education, in, in my judgment, was we put out a whole series of books called What Works. And there's a line in philosophy, which is you can prove the possible by the actual. And there are actually lots of schools out there, religious and non-religious, that do a really good job at moral education. And the question is, find out what, where they are, why do they work, and how can, how can you scale them, uh, them up. And, and it's going to be different for different parts of, of the country. I, let, let's think out loud a little bit about some of these things that you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I know it's not fair. You know, we've had a lot of people come who make it say, yeah, I'm not the education expert. You know, I, I, I'm a public intellectual. And so, you know, we kept trying to get Jonah Goldberg, tell us which history curriculum we should teach. You know, that, that wasn't quite fair. Uh, but, uh, but let me ask you about this. I, I, you make this incredibly important point, and yet I feel like we gloss over it. The adults in the buildings and how they live their lives and the model they set, right? I mean, we always know. We know as parents, right? We've got to practice what we preach right. because that's what the kids are paying attention to. Yep. My sons can call out hi hypocrisy yep. very quickly. Right. And so I can, you know, give them a, a great lecture on whatever, but what they're really watching is how do I live my life? Right. And so in the same way, that's, that's what teachers, these amazing people that are in there with our young people and the principals, what are they doing? How do they respond to issues in schools? How do they respond to kids mm -hmm. being bullies? How do they respond to mm -hmm. kids being disruptive? Or to kids being in pain or having, right? right? Uh, and again, I just, you know, we've had this big debate in the ed reform world in the last decade about how to evaluate teachers. Right. And we've got all these complicated protocols and, and uh, you, know, work, uh, you know, scoring sheets. Yeah. And I don't know, Susan or others, if we know, like, were, were there anything on there about character you know, and, and the kinds of things that you mentioned that nobody would disagree with. You know, is this teacher showing compassion? Are right. they, uh, you know, honest? Are they fair? Are they, you know, uh, go down your list. Yeah. Why, you know, why not? We, we should make that explicit. I, I mean, we, I think schools for a long time have said that they want teachers of good character, and that right. used to mean a certain thing way back, you know. But, but to say that we want to model what good character and virtue looks like. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm not an education expert. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. I think that makes complete sense. And, and I, uh, I'd say that one of the problems uh, may be that the education establishment, the education blob, uh, to use the term that, that uh, Checker coined years ago. <laughs> it was your phrase. It was, he, he just gave it the amplification. Um, the, um, you know, it makes it very hard for a, for a whole variety of complicated reasons to hold teachers accountable and to judge them and to reward them. Mm -hmm. uh, and I do think that if we were more intentional about um, putting a premium on this aspect of, of uh, uh, education and educators, which yeah. is the moral life that they embody um, and... and, and uh, and, and their sense of, of living lives of, of what you were talking about, dignity and care and compassion. I'm certain that if parents are able to rate teachers, that would be high on the list of things that they would say um, is important for me as a parent, for my kids uh, to be around. Because almost every parent that I know wants their child to grow up to be a good person. They want lots of different things about it. But they want their children to grow up to be honorable people. 
And we all know that the company you keep makes a difference, both yeah. your peer group and, and, and for authority figures. So I do think that if there was a way within the system to try and incentivize that, that would be um, an important thing. I wanted to say one other thing, by the way, what Secretary Page was talking about, just in the area of moral education, I don't think it, it's, it's an area that necessarily comes to mind for a lot of people, but I think that it does go on, and that's the realm of school activities like, mm -hmm. and sports. An awful lot of people that I know um, have helped their moral life in shape by their in, uh, involvement in sports activities. S perseverance, hard work, um, sense of teamwork, having the back of your teammates, mm -hmm. lo the loyalty, uh, being a good sport, uh, working mm -hmm. through, uh, you know, injury, c continuing when you're, when you're tired. I mean, there's so many different things that happen. And if you find a good coach, Mm -hmm. uh, that can be a life-changing thing for, for, for a lot of students, or at least it can be something that, that affirms these. So a lot of, I, in my estimation, a lot of what we talk about when we're talking about moral education, it's not a class per mm -hmm. se. It's an ethos. Right. It's, a, it's an ethic within a school, within a community, within a family. And those mm -hmm. things are, are mutually uh, reinforcing. And most of moral education is going to go on uh, somewhere besides a 50-minute class that, that might be dedicated explicitly to moral education. That's right. That's right. Uh, okay, so you say it's about the adults, it's about the curriculum, and it's about the rules. Okay, and, and you said in your talk, I, I love this, you said, uh, in a free society like the United States where external constraints on how we live our lives are limited, internal constraints are all the more necessary. And I think that may, that may, that's right. I mean, if we lived in a totalitarian state where, uh, you know, as uh, unfortunately some people around the world do, uh, rules everywhere, right. you know, that, that's a different proposition. Here we believe in living as, as free men and women. What does this mean for kids? And, and again, it's not fair to put you on the spot as, I, again, I know you're not the, the pedagogue, but I, some would argue that if we want kids to develop self-discipline, and to learn and live in a free society, we've got to find a way to let them have a lot of freedom. Mm -hmm. uh, that maybe a school that's got a ton of rules, like we see in some of the no excuses schools, the, the KIPP schools and others, you know, that, uh, you know, it does keep things orderly, it allows people to learn, it does keep away the chaos, but is it actually teaching self-discipline? Uh, and we've certainly heard stories that some of those KIPPsters uh, have gone off to college where there's none of that, and they've struggled mm -hmm. because they're, you know, and, and KIPP has changed its model somewhat as a result, especially as kids get older. I mean, how do, how do we think about that? Is, is it, I mean, do, do, we, do we need to teach kids how to live in a society that doesn't have rules about everything? Yeah, I, I would say um, that the way to approach this is um, you need to have both and you have to link them together. Uh, the idea that you're going to ease off on external rules in order to create internal order in a child, I, I think as a general matter doesn't work. Because if you pull uh, away the external constraints and rules, and of course, it depends on what we're talking about, right? We can all come up with excesses and, uh, from where the rules are too, too harsh. But as a general proposition, um, I wouldn't say that most schools in America are suffering from an overabundance of enforcement of codes of conduct and, uh, and, and, and norms and rules. And I think if you lose that, mm -hmm. then the idea that kids are going to internalize uh, self-discipline in the midst of chaos or, or external uh, lack of discipline just doesn't square. I, and I think most parents could tell you that mm -hmm. as well. Uh, what has to happen, it seems to me, and I think the literature backs this up, is you need reasonable external constraints, but at the same time you need to teach kids internal restraints as well mm -hmm. and it's a step-by-step -step process and it's also dependent in large part on age I mean you're yeah. going to treat a yeah. six-year-old different than a 12-year-old which is different than a 17-year-old right now obviously if you've got a senior in high school and they're about to go off to college then that child has got to have some capacity to navigate the world and if they're in a cloistered environment mm -hmm. where everything is done for them uh, and they're and they're insulated from the world, and then they go out there. That can be a jolting experience. Yeah. Uh, maybe a, it helps to talk a little bit, you know, personally about this. So, uh, we have my wife Cindy and I have three three children. One was in public school and high school, uh, McLean High. Uh, another 
it was homeschooled at her request from seventh mm -hmm. grade on. It's a homeschooling co-op, and the third one is at a uh, Christian school. Mm -hmm. So we've had we've had all all of them, mm -hmm. and um, so you know the homeschooling world and community probably of and including in the ten that, that were named here, you know there is a tendency I would say for. Uh, those to be maybe most, at least in the perception of a lot of people, most insulated from the word, most, most cloistered. Um, but my daughter is tremendously self-disciplined, mm -hmm. uh, and she went off to, to college, uh, and it hasn't, in that aspect, it hasn't been mm -hmm. difficult at all for her because she was able to routinize herself. She was a self-starter. Mm -hmm. We didn't really have to oversee it. And the reality is I'd love to take credit for that, but that's largely how, how she is as a human being. I, my own experience and what I've seen in, among other parents is that when kids turn out well, we talk about how important parenting is. And when <laughs> kids go astray, we talk about how important genetics and biology <laughs> and the limits of, that parents have over, right. uh, over, over, uh, over, our, our, uh, over our children. Um, so I, I just think you need to be, you need to be uh, careful. And, and uh, schools and parents need, need to be prudential in, in, in their judgments. I'll say one thing, which is somewhat countercultural, but we don't allow our son uh, to, to have an iPhone until he's 17. Mm -hmm. um, but it was very helpful. We, we had a, a, when we had a lunch uh, with my daughter, my youngest son, and Cindy and I, and uh, when Christine said, you know, one of the biggest favors you did for me was to keep me from having an iPhone until I was 17. Um, and that helps actually to have one sibling to be able to tell another that that that, that that's the case, um, you know. And and in our judgment, the iPhone and we've got it, but I know the temptations of them. And there's a lot of a lot of stuff that, mm -hmm. that that can be can be problematic. But we know full well that David is going to at some point go off and he's going to have an iPhone. Um, hopefully, we'll have put in place certain things in his life that he's able to handle that kind of uh, technology and. Um, and, and that's a challenge that, that, that parents and, and teachers face. Well, speaking of someone who is tempted by his iPhone, uh, this is a bad segue, uh, the president. Yes. All right. So, you know, in your essay and, you know, in your talk, I mean, you talk about all this importance of, of demonstrating good character and helping young people. And we've talked about the importance of teachers being role models. And here we have our president. And we are used to teaching our young people to respect our president. And they see him on television. And I think you and I both agree that he has quite often not been such a great example of character. How, how do we deal with that? How do we, if, if at all, should schools deal with that? I mean, what, and, and, and let's imagine, let's imagine that this is just not just a moment in time, but this is how our politics are going to go. He's, you know, there's going to be another Donald Trump out there sometime soon, uh, demonstrating not great character. Well, I don't know. Um, I don't want to make it just about him. I mean, how yeah. do we deal with this issue, as, especially as conservatives? Yeah, it's, um, I mean, I think we should deal with it honestly. Uh, I'd say as it relates to, to Donald Trump and schools, I mean, I try and stay away from that. I don't remember when Barack Obama was president or George W. Bush was president. They were particularly in significant figures in high school or in elementary school or in middle school. Um, and I think that schools, all of us need time and distance to put individual presidents within any historical context. Um, and I think one of the reason, one, one of the dangers of moral education is that it gets uh, twinned with some very controversial issues, issues of, of the day where people have very intense feelings, um, or some of the most contentious moral issues of all, abortion, euthanasia, I mean, you can go on and on. Um, you don't need to do that uh, in, 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 uh, in schools. I mean, you know, we've been doing this before. I don't, I don't know that it's important, actually, to teach uh, students to respect uh, the president. I think there's something to be said about respecting the presidency. Um, but on the other hand, you have to teach history truthfully and honestly. And there's certain things you can't avoid. So you can't avoid Watergate with Richard Nixon. That doesn't mean that, that Watergate was completely definitional to the Nixon presidency. Mm -hmm. You can cover the opening to China, the end of the Vietnam War, 
what he did in the environmental policy. I mean, you can go on and on. But you can't avoid it either, and you can't avoid naming it. Uh, same thing with Bill Clinton. Uh, the Lewinsky scandal was not the sum total of, um, of his presidency, but it was an important part. Impeachment happened, and you can't, you can't ignore that. You know, Donald Trump is a problem. Uh, and, uh, and I guarantee if, if he were a Democrat, a lot of Republicans would think he's a problem. But uh, it's the nature of partisan tribal politics that now that Donald Trump is in office and he's a Republican, that uh, all of a sudden character doesn't matter. It used to count. It used to matter, as I recall, a few uh, years ago. But, uh, but suddenly he's now given, given a pass. That's a problem. Um, but that's not a problem that schools uh, need, uh, need, need to, uh, to deal with. Um, but, uh, you know, when, when, with the passage of time, when we assess the Trump presidency, um, and there's, if, the, if there's an attention to his character, um, I think we all know what the verdict is going, is going to be. It's an odd thing. There's certainly been, been presidents who themselves have, have not embodied nobility uh, or high character, or who have in some respects and not in others. So you can have martial valor, and you can have mm -hmm. infidelity, right? So life is complicated. And nobody is is a saint across across the board. Um, since you brought up his name, I, the, the thing that's interesting about Donald Trump, in my estimation, um, is that you, it's going to be very very hard to find some aspect anywhere in his character that is um, something you can point to as ad admirable and something that is worth uh, worth uh, um, uh, following. Um, that doesn't mean that people shouldn't vote for him because of his policies. doesn't mean that he hasn't done anything good as a president. People can debate that. But on the issue of character mm -hmm. and political leadership and the presidency, um, that is a problem because he's the most important person in the world, the most talked about person in the world. And I think the danger in these kinds of things, this is true of the president, it's true of uh, athletes, it's true of all mm -hmm. sorts of people, mm -hmm. uh, actors, they have a certain influence in the moral imagination of people, including, um, including uh, uh, children. I do want to say one thing as well, which is, you know, moral education goes on in areas other than, than, than schools and other than politics, too. And, and one of the questions that you hear is, that, and it's, it's a le legit one, which is, how do you, um, tr how do you uh, try to convince people that a moral life is not just an honorable life, but a life of joy and fulfillment. How do you, how do you send the signals that it's a life that, that young people in particular should want to follow? Um, and I think part of the answer is what, what the wider culture talks about and what parents talk about and what adults talk about. I think what Irving said in that quote, which is I, most people say that character matters, but I don't know that we, that we talk about it very much or very compellingly. Yeah. Um, or that, that it leads to a happy life. Right? Exactly. Right? This line in here that it's, you know, it leads to human flourishing. Right? Yes. Right? And, and joy. joy. And yeah. joy. Yeah. Um, and I just think we need to be able to talk about that. There's been, I think, over the years, over the decades, a kind of reticence about that. that yeah. People are worried that if they talk that way, it may come across as moralistic. Mm. It's not moralistic. It doesn't have to be that way. Um, and then you see things like David Brooks uh, has a new book, which I'd commend to everybody, called The Second Mountain, which is a book about uh, moral life and moral joy and, and the various commitments. He, he lists four different commitments. That book is the number one bestseller in the New York Times, or it will be when, when it, I guess, next week. And uh, David is an extremely prominent mm -hmm. voice. He's a, he's, a, he's a good friend of mine. It's a wonderful book. And that, that helps shape culture, right? When, when somebody like David Brooks talks about the inner life mm -hmm. of, of, uh, of people and what, what moral joy is and how to attain it, that, that can make a difference. Um, the Avengers Endgame, I'm, I'm not going to go into the spoiler <laughs> alert for people who haven't seen it, but you know, that movie, it's, it was the most anticipated movie of all time. It's going to break all the box it already has for how long it's been mm -hmm. out, and by the time it's done, it will, it will be the the, the uh, biggest grossing movie of, uh, of all time. And you see characters in that movie who are admirable, including people who in some of the earlier movies you weren't so sure about. Mm -hmm. And you find out that in this, in this movie, they actually um, lived for something beyond themselves. 
Now that that's a kind of thing that I mean, if you can get the Avengers uh, to, to to be able to, uh, without being censorious or 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 or, or finger wagging about it, can kind of embody uh, virtue and character, then that. Uh, that may be even better than uh, than a class at uh, high school. That's great. I'm going to have to explain all this to Checker later, but I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We allude to the non-school side of character formation, right? And I want to go to the civil society side of mm -hmm. character formation. I mean, what's ringing in my ears almost 60 years later is the Boy Scout yeah. oath: the trustworthy, right. loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind. I, I could go on. I think yeah. I could finish it. Yes. Uh, that came from an outside of school activity and organization. Right. If we're in an era of bowling alone when these things are in poor repair, are we ending up layering, l l laying too much on the schools to take the place of this kind of thing? And are we now uh, hoping Hollywood will fill, the, will fill the void with movies? I think that's what The Avengers is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, that's, that's, uh, that's, that, is, that is what it is. Um, yeah, we have to engage in remedial education, I can see here. Um, <laughs> Yeah, look, you're right about the Boy Scouts, uh, and it, I, I would say that if you were to characterize uh, the times in which we live, some of the broad, in broad strokes, what characterizes this, this moment, I would say isolation, alienation, kind of fracturing of human relationships. Um, and I think that explains why a number of pathologies have gotten much worse recently. Mm -hmm. um, youth suicide is way, way uh, up. Um, and uh, and so are several others, and I think that is a product of this of of of, of a lack of connection. Uh, you know, I mentioned the iPhone um, earlier. This is kind of the irony, right? Which is what, if you go back and read the promise of social media and the iPhone generation, it was supposed to bring people together to connect them. It was one of the great hopes, uh, Facebook and all of the rest. If you if you read it sort of in the 1990s. As this stuff was dawning on us, yeah, exactly, and it's had the opposite effect. For one thing, it's 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 of course in our politics, it's, it's made people more tribalistic, and it, and certainly within politics, it's 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 turned it into hatred and, and bitterness or amplified those. But beyond that, what we found out is that these kind of human relationships that are so essential to uh, to living a good and fulfilled life have 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 been. Uh, interrupted and, and sidelined and mitigated and people now live you know, in, in texting and, and that, that there's something about the human relationship, mm -hmm. the person to person contact, the eye to eye contact, the, the conversations that's as important to being a human being as you don't get if you're, if you're doing it through, uh, through electronics. Yeah. And yeah, if you lose these institutions, the Boy Scouts and all of these other ones that you can go, you can go through civil association, you lose a huge amount. And I agree with you, Jack. I, uh, I mean, we've both been critical of the establishments and the schools, and they're not performing like they should. But uh, I think that, that a lot of that there's a tendency to blame the schools for just about everything, and to say, well, we, you know, we failed in these other areas, and so the school has to make up for it. And that's right. not what schools were designed for. And they need allies too. I, I in my own history of, of uh, in the conservative movement, and I'm a lifelong conservative. Uh, and again, I say this because I think there there's certainly reasons to be critical of, of of the education establishment and so forth. But at least when I talk to individual teachers, I suspect it's true of of, of you all too. Uh, they're they're asked to do an awful lot, uh, and. Um, and and they need they need an assist too. We we need to step up our game as well as asking them to step up their game. All right, we've got time for one more question. If anybody's got a burning one out there, I'll let you think about it. You know, it, it is interesting. It keeps coming up. Twice, you know, this, this notion of extracurriculars as being so valuable, and it strikes me they they are the little platoons yeah. of our education system. I mean, we in in many high schools in this country, we do have a very lively civil society that's flourishing. I've always wondered the history of why is it that we wait till high school, you know, and, and we don't have the same tradition of, of having the public pay for activities like that when kids are at uh, middle school and certainly elementary school, yeah. you know, and, and, and maybe we should, again, put more on the schools or maybe we should fund it some other way, but... Uh, the fourth grade marching band. I'm serious. <laughs> They're ready for it. My All right. We do have it. a question right over here, though. Good. Yeah, I'll always go. <laughs> so... Uh, I know you, that this kind of relates to the before conversation about discipline. You said there's no harder time to teach than today because 
Uh, we don't necessarily ask students to respect their teachers before they start demanding respect in return and trying to teach that's an equation. We, we, um, my former students know there was, knew there was no teeth in the if you cheat or plagiarize, mm -hmm. there will be consequences right. until you do it you know, 10 times. Mm -hmm. So all those policies aside, what I'm curious about is in the actual content, to me, and this could be my own bias because I was an English teacher, full disclosure, mm -hmm. the humanities presents this amazing opportunity for character development. Right. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, a large portion of society, I think it started off higher ed and now it's trickling down to high school, has told us that these are soft subjects. They're not important. Mm -hmm. They're not STEM. They're not going to get you a job. You shouldn't put forth your best effort in English because you know, you'll get an A if you don't even try, whereas math, you really need to focus. And I'm wondering if you think this is having an effect on character and moral development. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I, I, in some ways, you're pushing on an open door because I'm somebody whose, I guess, history and disposition is, <laughs> is toward the humanities. Um, and I agree with you. I mean, I just think that the humanities, rightly taught, rightly understood, um, is so important. Uh, or can be uh, uh, su such an auxiliary, such an ally in, in, in moral development because great books and great stories reach people. I was, you know, talking earlier about sort of the moral imagination and it, that's how you shape it. Um, how do you reach the hearts and minds of people? Because that eventually, ultimately, is what you have to win over. Uh, living a, a good life is not easy. Um, it's, there, there are a lot of things uh, in the world that are that are that are lined up against it, so you have to you have to summon those those things, and it's not simply rigor, and it's not just discipline. You actually have to have your you 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 have to have your hopes tapped into and your and your aspirations, and I think that the humanities is a great way to um, to do that. I mean, it's, I, I imagine it's complicated uh, because. Uh, those those science, hard subjects, STEM, and all of the rest are essential too, and we've seen erosion there, uh, and and so I think we've seen erosion across across the board. So um, I don't know if it's one at the expense of other, or whether we just have to find out ways to do all of them um, mm -hmm. better. Um, but if in the effort to push you know, the sciences and the STEM uh, classes that we give up on or we diminish the importance of the humanities, then I think we lose um, a lot uh, because I think if you go through, uh, you know, many of the greatest figures in American history, I think the reasons that, some of the reasons that they would say that they were, were became who they were uh, Lincoln would be a preeminent example, was because of these great stories that captured uh, that captured their 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 imagination. And you know, I I think we have to make the case for this. You yeah. Know, Yuval Levin, when he was here, you know, talked about that uh, much of education reform has felt technocratic. Yes. You know, and it and it has. I mean, we've been very focused on an important question, which is how do we help kids have economic success, especially kids growing up in poverty, and that leads us into a certain you know set of policies and a focus, but. But that we, it's time to make the case again that that's important, but that's not everything. Yeah. And we also want to teach kids how to be good and how to have a good life. Right. And, uh, and so thank you for your time. Thank you. 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 Thank you.